It's June 2019. Flights to Mexico had concluded, but E3 was also going on at the same time. They happened to line up. I mean, there's only so many weekends in a year to plan a convention. I don't think anyone expected what was about to happen that day. Xbox would take the stage to reveal something that would shock all of us. Reviving Flight Sim after leaving it 10 years ago with an E3 reveal. That's kind of high stakes, right? Just look at this chat replay on YouTube. Wait, this guy said Flight Sim World? I think he needs to get in the loop. The timing was kind of ironic, being the end of the biggest Flight Sim nerd out in North America. By the way, yes you should go. More information's in the video description. It was so shocking that my Twitter timeline was filled with various game industry people and news outlets talking about it. But you clicked on this video to hear about what PC specs you'll need to run Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. In this video, I'm going to offer evidence to suggest that the specs that you think you will need are not the specs that you will need. But first, let's take a step back to understand why Flight Sim has reached its performance peak and why a new platform is necessary. If you want to skip to the specs part, go to the timecode on screen. We saw when we released Flight Simulator 10, our customers and partners came to us and they said, can we use your technology to build a real world simulation on top of it for our training products? So we did that with Microsoft ESP. In January of 2008, we released that version of the product. And we did that as a software platform so that our customers could create visual simulation products. Microsoft ESP was a simulation development platform created out of FSX by the ACES team. The goal was to offer a simulation platform that was easily developed for and attractive to companies seeking a simple way to build training programs for aviation and defense. After the ACES studio was disbanded, the ESP platform was licensed to Lockheed Martin in the early 2010s. This created the P3D platform, also known as Prepared, which was still pretty cryptic in its first few versions. As with ESP, Prepared was marketed to commercial customers. The goals of the platform were far from something like FSX, an entertainment product, despite using the ESP platform as a base. It took some time for the general flight sim community to start adopting Prepared as a viable option. Over time with more usage, developers started creating content for Prepared like aircraft and scenery, usually airports, but also products that helped alleviate some of the issues with the platform. The problem with FSX and Prepared at that point was, it was still a 32-bit application. This meant that it was only able to make use of 4GB of RAM internally, which caused many problems for enthusiasts and add-on developers alike. Even X-Plane had its own problems, most apparent a very confusing UI with hundreds of options. Fortunately, in 2017, Lockheed finally reworked Prepared to be a 64-bit platform, and in 2016, X-Plane 11 launched into a beta stage, which fixed many of its interface problems. Despite all of this, Flight Sim has still been stuck in the past. The main problem is that both platforms run old rendering engines which stifle their ability to be like other modern games in terms of rendering performance and stability. At least, this is true when discussing the way that most sim enthusiasts use these platforms today. But just listen to how ridiculous these old ads for Flight Sim were. Oh boy. If there was no video to go with this, it would sound like the beginning of a B-list Hollywood aviation film. But let's not completely crap on FSX here. The second release of FSX significantly increased the amount of people who tried Flight Sim, even if they weren't serious. It sold over 600,000 copies in only a few years. This helped build the Flight Sim community that exists today. By the time of this second release, it had low system requirements, and it also goes on sale all the time, so it's a very affordable way to gauge your interest in this genre. So why should you be optimistic this time around? Well, there's a lot of information out there we can use to understand the situation. There was a developer interview from XO19, the London Xbox conference, that talks about performance on mid-range PCs. Of course, these are demo builds, but at the same time, remember that these builds the figures are coming from are early and are far from release optimized as well, so it's very likely only going to improve. In this interview with Sebastian, CEO of Asobo Studio, he gives a lot of information about how the simulator can adapt to differing spec hardware configurations. Here at XO19, we have relatively a big machine, but we shoot in native 4K, that is to say without upscale. 
Me, for example, I don't have such a big configuration since I take care of everything that's aerodynamic, so I needed to be very responsive. I have a GTX 1060 and I play in full HD or sometimes in 1440. Here at X 19 on average, we are at 45 frames per second, and that's in 4K. Then it is a game that suffers very little from upscaling. I personally do not see the difference, and it often allows to double the number of frames per second without affecting the level of detail. Next, we have five or six levels of detail with different options inside. The GTX 1060 being the mesh and graphics card is important. It's a card many people already use and is only going to further come down in price. And even better than that, which I will highlight later, the GTX 1660 Super beats the performance of the 1060 in that example at a similar price point. So, competent cards for flight sim have become pretty affordable, and fortunately we're still not living in the crypto mining dark ages where mid-tier cards, which MSRP'd at $300, were going for double the price. Another element to consider is that as I pointed out, flight sim has been a fragmented ecosystem for a long time. You have installers for your airports, aircraft, camera, the list goes on. The problem with a fragmented ecosystem is that you can push the platform beyond what it was designed to do. And this is why we've hit the ceiling of performance and why we deal with so many simulator issues. Having a unified ecosystem will not only improve simulator performance and solve the infinite problem of tweaking in flight sim, but will empower developers to focus on what we really want in flight sim, more airplanes. Madice from Aerosoft highlighted this point and the potential for this platform running on affordable hardware in a forum post. He says, at the same time, Microsoft is showing us what a simulator can look like in this day and age. As you might know, Asobo was so kind to invite me a few times to their offices as I live close to them. And when we saw the sim for the first time running, the sound you heard was Jaws hitting the floor. What we all thought were rendered demo videos turned out to be real in-game footage, not even on a crazy harbor system. In follow-up visits, we learned a lot about the platform, what can be done, how things should be done, and above anything, how to determine Microsoft and Asobo are to assist developers. If we have a question, we call them and get answers. Let me tell you, that's bloody amazing. As Madice points out, developers being able to create content on a unified platform is literally the dream and it should not have taken this long for us to get to this point in the first place. But maybe the best example of the potential of a simulator rebuilt from the ground up for performance is to look at DCS. Some flights and veterans watching this video may know about how DCS used to run and look. It exhibited many of the symptoms that we have in Flight Sim today, and while I don't completely agree with its very closed development model when working with third parties, in some ways, it benefits the end user. After the platform relaunched its reworked engine, its performance increased significantly, and it became one of the best VR titles on the market. If you don't know, VR requires very smooth performance that we do not currently have in Flight Sim. We simply cannot reach the frame rates required to meet virtual reality's potential in these platforms where we are injecting tons of add-ons to push the sim way beyond what it was intended to do. As Asobo has said, the simulator will require a decent internet connection for the optimal experience as you are streaming the world data around you as you fly. But considering both Microsoft Flight Simulator and DCS are built on DirectX 11 and have a lot of the same goals, let's look at what DCS suggests that you need to run it well as an idea for what to expect. For its minimum requirements, it suggests an i3 at about 3 GHz. I think I'll bump this up to suggest something like a 4th gen Intel i5 or newer, or maybe an older Ryzen 5. It recommends a GTX 760 as a minimum. I think it would be wise to say that MFS would run better with a decent amount of video memory since you're streaming world data around you, so it's probably good to suggest a GTX 970 here as a baseline, but it's possible an older car might work okay. The minimum RAM requirement is 8GB while recommending 16 in specific circumstances. But there isn't a reason to not build a PC with 32 gigs of RAM these days, or at least 16 and then adding the other 16 later. RAM prices have come way down in the past few years. In X-Plane, for example, you benefit from more RAM by being able to tweak things like draw distance, also known as extended DSF, and by running satellite imagery or ortho scenery for the Earth. The parallel between Microsoft Flight Simulator and X-Plane here is that ortho and long draw distance in X-Plane benefits from more RAM, and so in theory you could keep your draw distance high with more RAM in Microsoft Flight Simulator if you have sufficient video memory. 
This is why I mentioned the GTX 1660 Super earlier. It's a cheap upgrade or build option that offers a lot for the price. However, I'm not endorsing that 32 gigs of RAM is a requirement for Microsoft Flight Simulator at all. Reddit already proved this by showing that someone did get invited to test Microsoft Flight Simulator with 16 gigabytes of RAM. Really, the most important element is probably the graphics card. With a modern reworked engine on DirectX 11, when you look at DX11 titles and the resources they use, it tends to lean more towards the graphics card than the CPU. I think the most affordable card that hits the baseline for recommended performance when looking at these titles is the GTX 1660 Super. And this is great because it is very affordable and has very solid rendering performance in these titles, which is really what we're going off here. Allow me to say that I'm not saying there's not a reason to upgrade. If you think you want to run Microsoft Flight Simulator at higher resolutions or in ultra wide, and also if you want to run VR in Microsoft Flight Simulator, which I think will be a feature eventually looking at their feedback snapshots, it should prove useful. So what would you need to spend to be ready assuming you're not already involved? Well, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is it's more than buying an Xbox, but the good news is it's a lot less than what you might have thought before watching this video. I created an example parts list on PC Part Picker based on what we talked about. Don't focus on cooling or the power supply as that is up to you. We're mainly concerned with the core components of processor, RAM, and graphics cards. I'd always encourage running any flight sim on a solid state drive because of the low access time which helps prevent application bottlenecks. In our example build, we came out around $800 for a completely new build, which is very good and affordable and shows how modern the new platform is, unlike when I run a high-end system that still allows P3D to freeze somehow. Pull up. Pull up. What? Uh... What? But what if you're looking to spend more to get a high-end experience? It's reasonable to assume that Flight Sim will still desire some CPU resources in dense cities or areas with a lot of vegetation. As shown here, it may be beneficial to invest in a higher-end processor for this reason. Of course, it's also good to feature-proof your system if you're building a new one for this release. The RTX Super cards offer good value at the lower end, like the 1660 Super, but also at the higher end. The RTX 2070 Super is about 500 right now and will offer more video memory which should be helpful when ramping up your object density. Again, more RAM can assist with setting higher draw distances. Before concluding this video, I want to shout out Microsoft and Asobo for their feature discovery videos which have been doing a great job of explaining the development process, and also for working with the larger community on building the future of flight simulation. You guys are doing a great job, so keep it up! I hope that the information that I presented was helpful. If it was, please leave a like on this video and subscribe to my channel. You can let me know what videos or topics you'd be interested in, or questions you might still have by leaving a comment, joining my Discord server at the link below, coming to my Twitch stream to chat about it, or by following on Twitter and sending a message. Thanks for watching.